Should you add a crop, drop a crop, or change a crop? If you are a commercial herb grower, that's a question you have to answer each year. Stay with us for ideas on how to decide. Welcome to Richter's Seminars. This video presentation is from a series of free educational seminars on herb and garden topics offered each year at Richter's. For farmers, a perennial question they face each year is what crops to grow. What mix of crops will make the most money? Should one add crops, drop crops, or change crops? For growers in the commercial herb industry, it's no different. Whether growers are growing herbs out in the field or in the greenhouse, they need to make sure that no problems stand in the way of their crops and their buyers. Herbs are very different from other crops. One of the big differences is that there is no place you can show up with your crop and expect to sell it, like there is for corn or soybeans, or for fresh fruits and vegetables. Production requirements can vary considerably. Some herbs need shade and others don't. Some are root crops, others are whole herb or leaf or seeds. Some are annuals and others are perennials and can take more than a year to produce a harvest. And there is no crop insurance for herbs. So while herbs can be quite profitable, they inherently come with more risks. And getting the crop mix right in order to minimize risk is probably more important than many growers realize. When we talk about commercial herb production in North America, we're talking about the four market segments, fresh herbs, dried herbs, potted herbs, and value-added products, products such as packaged herbal teas that have value added to them on the farm. Each of these segments requires different approaches to crop mix. Some require that you grow a wide range of plants in order to be effective in the market. Others don't. When we think about adding a crop to our mix, we're usually thinking about expanding our business, adding a new field or another greenhouse. Clearly, the reason is to increase revenue and profit. But there are other reasons for adding a crop. Adding a crop can help manage the risk of crop failure and possible financial ruin. Adding crops can augment market effectiveness or impact. If you have a better selection, then your customers have more reasons for doing business with you. There are many other reasons for adding another crop to your mix, such as crop rotation. But today, I want to focus on managing your risk and enhancing your market impact. Risk in business can mean different things to different people. But I'm referring to the risk of failing to make a sale after the hard work of growing a crop. You may fail to make a sale because of production problems, or poor quality due to disease or pests, or maybe your crop doesn't meet the customer's specifications, or it is too late and the customer can't use it anymore, or maybe you produce a top quality crop but you have no buyer and you don't know how to reach the buyers who need your crop. There is an undeniably higher risk of crop failure with herbs compared to other crops. One big reason is it's harder to find reliable information on how to grow the herb crops and despite the good work of good of, of government crop specialists and university extension services, there is generally a lot less crop support for growers when help is needed. More often than not, growers are on their own when production problems crop up. If you are a conventional grower, you will find that there are not a lot of chemicals registered for use on herbs. And your crop can become worthless overnight if your buyer disappears. I remember a couple of fresh herb growers I know in Ontario were told by a major groceries chain 
that the chain will no longer be buying their herbs. I remember vividly one of them calling me up desperate for suggestions on what to do. The other grower actually went bankrupt. For these and other reasons, herbs do come with higher risk. But fortunately, that risk is manageable, and it is further offset by generally high prices paid for herb crops on a per acre or per square foot basis. I think experienced growers instinctively know a great deal about the kind of risks that I am talking about. They know the pain of a lost crop. Whether you are experienced or not, I would like to indulge you for a moment with a simple little exercise on the next few slides to illustrate how, how risk changes when you add crops. Imagine that you have a fixed production area. It may be a field of a couple of acres or it may be a few greenhouses. And we add a crop that we you, uh, when we add a crop, we are dividing up the existing production area into smaller areas so that the total production area always stays the same. Imagine also that each crop we grow has a 10% chance of failure. Or in other words, there is a 10% chance that the crop will be unsaleable and we get nothing for our efforts. If we grow only one crop, then that 10% risk means that over a 10-year period, we will have a failure in one of the years. And in this chart, that occurs in the eighth year. If we do not have enough financial reserves to get through a year without any revenue, then we could go bankrupt in year eight. Now add a second crop. Both crops are still subject to the same 10% risk of failure, but the loss in crop A happens in year 8 and in crop B in year 5. The actual years when the losses happen are completely arbitrary. The losses could have happened in any other year. It really doesn't matter for the purpose of this exercise. The important thing to note is that now there is at least some revenue in every year. If your costs are running at about 60% of your revenue, then you are still, you're still losing money in the two years when the crops fail, but the business is not threatened with bankruptcy. Here's the situation for three crops. Again, each crop is susceptible to failure 10% of the time. But note that the baseline revenue rises to 67%. If your cost of production is 60%, you will make a small profit every year. Albe uh, you'll make a profit every year, albeit a small one in the years when the losses occur. Well, now I'm boring you. Here is four crops, with the baseline revenue rising to 75%. And here's the five crop situation with the baseline rising to 80%. And just to prove that we herb people can be quite colorful when we try, here's the 10 crop situation. Still, the baseline revenue is 80%, but it is filling in. And if we keep adding crops, the baseline rises even more. Here's the single crop and many crop situations compared. What I'm sure you have already realized is that as you add more crops, you are spreading the costs of failure across the years. You don't actually avoid losses. They are an inevitable part of doing business here. But you take the hit in manageable doses that don't kill. For this little exercise, I arbitrarily set the risk of failure at 10%. Nobody knows what the real risk of failure is for the various herb crops. This is not a number that is tracked by anybody, yet it is vitally important to your success as a grower of herbs. It would be different for different herb crops, and of course much depends on your skill as a grower, processor, and marketer of herbs. 
Some specialty herb crops, such as black cohosh or bloodroot, probably have risks of failure higher than 10%. But that 10% is probably not too far off the mark for many crops. It would be great if somebody would track these failure rates on a crop-by-crop -crop basis. But of course that presupposes that growers are willing to share this information. Herb people tend to be optimists. So when growers sit down to make the all-important tally of their costs in order to set their prices, I suspect very, very few are thinking about the cost of crop failure when they make their calculations. The likely practice is to say, okay, the buyer has agreed to pay $100 a pound and my direct cost of production is $60, so I'm going to make a gross profit of $40 a pound. Of course, there are overhead expenses, too, and if the grower is tracking those and knows that it averages $30 a pound, then he or she will calculate a net profit of $100 less $60 less $30 or $10 a pound. That grower may think that the price to pay, uh, that the buyer is paying is okay because there is a profit. But if the grower is losing a crop once every 10 years, then in reality the grower is not making a profit at all you need to include that cost associated with the risk of failure in your calculation of prices. Another reason for adding another crop to your mix is to enhance your Im impact on the market. The importance of market impact depends very much on what market segment you are in. In some markets, having a bigger selection and better covering your buyer's herbal needs can be important. Let's take fresh herbs as an example. It is one of the four mar main market segments that I listed on an earlier slide. Because of the nature of fresh herbs, that they are perishable, there is a value to a buyer in finding a supplier that can supply all of the buyer's needs. If a high-end restaurant is buying fresh herbs locally, how much easier is it, is it for them to buy from just one grower rather than a bunch of different growers, each specializing in one crop? It's one contact, one invoice, and one check when it's one grower. Recall what I said earlier about the two growers that suffered terribly when the grocery chain decided to change suppliers. In at least one of the cases, I know that the grocery chain switched because the grower was not able to supply fresh herbs year-round. So that grower was not a perfect supplier to that buyer. Buyers, of course, want price and quality, but often they also want selection and reliable supply. And in fresh herbs, that means a year-round supply. So what can you do about that? In Ontario, as in most regions, it is virtually impossible to grow everything a buyer wants within a market segment. Well, one option is to separate oneself from the other growers by growing items that the buyer can't get from other growers. Growers who get excited about herbs and use them will inevitably find a way to differentiate themselves from the opportunist, opportunist growers who care only about the money. Herb growers who actually care about herbs will be trying new things all the time. And in the corner somewhere, they'll have test plots of what they think will be the next big thing in herbs. By having a healthy share of exciting new things on the product list, these growers can keep and pick up buyers that they wouldn't otherwise have. Carrying on with the fresh herb example, it is pretty clear that a grower growing product outdoors can't offer fresh herbs year-round. 
Maybe he or she will go to root of expanding the growing season by growing some herbs under cover. Or maybe the grower will go another route and focus on selection and offer compelling items that keeps the interests of buyers. In the next few slides, I will show a few of the new fresh herbs that have some capacity for creating a differentiating buzz in your market. This is a fascinating plant. It and a number of closely related species comes under different names such as toothache cress, paracress, or just spilanthus, the name of a genus. In Europe, the fresh flowers are being marketed to high-end restaurants as electric buttons or Sichuan buttons. The flowers produce a tingling sensation in the mouth. They are being pitched for use in desserts and in cocktails. Top chefs are always looking for something special to distinguish themselves from the rest and to justify the prices that they charge. This little flower fits the bill, giving a jolt to their pa patrons and to their bottom line. This is, a, this is closely related to sorrel, but much nicer looking. This is Bloody Dock, and a few years ago we discovered how great it is to add this to salads. It has the same wonderful tart taste of sorrel, but the blood red venation and stems makes it a striking new fresh ingredient for salads. You don't make the salad out of just Bloody Dock. You add a few leaves to a mix of other salad ingredients. With the acidic edge it is a very noticeable and welcome addition to a fresh salad mix. Culantro is a herb that has been growing steadily in popularity. It is listed as Mexican coriander in our catalog, but its Mexican name, Culantro, is becoming better known. This belongs to a group of herbs that can broadly be classed as coriander-like. Of course, the biggie is cilantro, and cilantro is a herb that went from virtually nothing to rapidly popular in a space of about three decades in North America. Well, culantro may well follow the, a similar path. It is different and stronger and plays a big role in Mexican and Caribbean cuisines. Surprisingly, the exact same herb is used in South Asian cooking. I first learned about it from a Vietnamese friend. So this herb has a long pedigree as a fresh cut herb and I believe it is just a matter of time for it to hit the big time in North America. These three, Paracras, Bloody Dock and Culantro, are just a taste of the future herbal stars that are available today to add to your fresh herb lineup. Changing gears now, I want to leave the fresh herb market segment and talk a little bit about the dried botanicals market. This market is totally different. The buyers are different, the, pro the crop production and processing needs are different, and the risks and market impact needs are very different. First off, dried botanical buyers are used to buying a single crop from a grower. So having a range of items is not necessary from the buyer's perspective. Of course, it is nice for the buyer if he, he or she can buy a bunch of different items from you in order to fill a container or a truck. But growing just a few crops in the dried botanicals business can make sense from a production standpoint. So, uh, but of course, you do not ex escape the risk factor. In fact, with botanicals, there are always a number of quality specifications that you must meet or your product may not be saleable. Buyers need a certificate of identity, a certificate of analysis, and if organic, a certificate for your farm. Those are the minimum. Often buyers want more, such as test results for heavy metals and pathogens. Any one of these requirements can trip you up if you do not have the documentation or if your product does not meet the buyer's specifications. So, although dried botanicals are not 
not perishable like fresh herbs. Their risks are really just shifted to other parameters. And so if you choose to focus on one or two dried botanical crops, <clears throat> you will not escape the risk of crop loss just because the crop is dried. A typical dried herb produced in North America is lemon balm. This is a whole herb crop, one which you harvest the whole above ground parts of a plant. The material is dried and will need to be milled and then bagged. Milling is usually done on the farm to minimize packing volume and hence shipping costs. There are many stories of growers pulling out a perfectly good crop out of a field only to lose the whole crop because of improper drying or storage and the growth of molds. The steps from harvesting to bagging and storage are all potential points of failure. In Ontario, there are a number of growers that are having success with certain subclasses of herbs, such as dried roots. These growers take advantage of the fact that the different root crops can use similar harvesting equipment and the drying and processing is similar. Valerian, Echinacea, Dandelion are the main ones. These crops do not need artificial shade like the woodland root crops do such as ginseng, golden seal, and black cohosh, and they make it easier for farms that once grew tobacco or other open crops to enter the industry. Because these herbs are among the, most, the more important in the industry, growers have more market options and can maximize their prices and minimize risk. Just as growers must know when to add a crop, growers need to know when to drop a crop. Of course, low sales are a good reason. That goes without saying. Low profit and closely tied to that low production efficiency due to lack of scale of, uh, of uh, economy and lack of mechanization. These are reasons to drop a crop. If prices have tanked, well, that's a good reason too. Production problems can emerge and they can completely change the profitability of a crop. Since downy mildew was first spotted in Basel in North America in 2007, we are hearing about growers losing their entire basil crops. Downy mildew is a disease that spreads quickly through a field, causing leaf damage and defoliation. So far, there are no really good effective control strategies for the disease. So the risk, of, the risk of failure for fresh basil crops is high, especially outdoors. Greenhouse basil is not so risky because the closed environment restricts the flow of spores from outside sources. If I can return briefly to the exercise I dragged you through earlier, we can ask what is the effect when we drop a crop? Let's assume that we are starting with 10 crops and we are not happy with the low profits that we are making for all our hard work. Should we add a crop or would we be better off dropping a crop? <clears throat> of course, the answer depends on the particulars of a crop you are thinking of dropping. But <clears throat> for the moment, let's assume that one crop is just as good as another and that the only issue is the number of crops that we are growing. We know that each crop has its own requirements. When to seed, when to feed and weed, when to harvest, how to prepare for market, and to whom to market it. All this has to be in somebody's head, and that someone has to be ready to address any unexpected challenges. This management cost factors into the total cost of a crop, and it's not zero. There's a limit to how many crops a grower can handle effectively from seed to sale. Economies of scale play an even bigger role. If you are growing so many crops that your plots are too small for a tractor to get in, well, you've got a problem. 
Clearly, there is a point when having too many crops reduces efficiency to the point where you lose money. <laughs> this sets up a dynamic where you have to balance the gains you get from the greater efficiency of fewer crops against the benefits of managing the, the risk of crop failure. To illustrate how this could play out, let us start with the 10 crop situation. Let's assume that each crop added incurs an additional cost equal to 3% of the base crop production cost. If we return to the single crop situation, the base cost of production was 60%. But as we add crops, we add 3% cost for each crop we add. This means that when we grow 10 crops, our cost of production is 60% plus 9 times 3% or 27% for a total cost of production of 87%. Given that our average revenue over the 10 years is 90% as we spread the risk of crop failure over the 10 years, then we would be close to breaking even most years and losing money in three years, making decent money only three years out of ten. At five crops, we make more money um, and we make the most money when we just grow one crop. But that comes with the unacceptable risk of complete failure in one year. So there is a real balancing act and each situation will play out differently. Often growers need to tweak their crop mix by changing a crop in some way. It could be an improved variety or a customer needing a different variety. Uh, or perhaps there are production problems that necessitate a change in variety. Before Danny Mildew arrived on the scene, fusarium wilt troubled basil growers. Seemingly overnight, basil crops were destroyed by, de by the disease. The main strategy for control of fusarium was to test for and eliminate infected seeds as a source of disease. Along with that was an effort to develop disease-tolerant varieties, such as the Nufar hybrid variety developed in Israel. Now we don't hear much about fusarium, but it can come back. Best practices might include using tolerant varieties where possible, but as in the case of Nufar basil, the aroma and flavor characteristics are not as desirable and so the susceptible varieties still dominate the market. There's been a lot of breeding activity in herb crops to improve crop characteristics important to growers and their customers. <coughs> in the next few slides, I want to give you a small taste of some of the improved varieties that have been introduced in the past few years. A big breeding goal has been uniformity. Another has been compactness and appearance for potted plant sales. Most of the breeding activity has been on, on the culinary side. On the medicinal side, things are slower moving because the, tip, the breeders are breeding for their own production use and often don't share those, those developments with the wider grower community. So the slides I'm going to show necessarily focus on the culinary side. This is a beautiful new basil called Dolly. As you can see, it is a Genovese type and it is remarkably uniform and lush. It is also a high yielding variety. I remember years ago how basil varieties were all over the map in size and shape. So we have come a very long way with the uniform varieties that we have today. This is a terrific new purple basil. Notice that there is very little green in the picture, just a few small spots on some lower leaves. In the 1980s, the purple basils descended into a green-purple mess. 
as seed growers got lazy and didn't do the hard work of removing off types from their seed production fields. Even the All-America winners, Dark Opal and Purple Ruffles, had deteriorated. When Reuben Basil came, came out in the 1990s, that was a big deal because it was the only good Purple Basil at the time. But it was never really robust. The stems are relatively weak and the growth habit is a bit rangy. It certainly did not have the overall aesthetic appeal that dark opal and purple ruffles did. But this variety, rosy, is a very nice improvement in the purple basil category. This is cobalt garlic chives. Again, a breeding goal is uniformity in this case in the flower and height of the plants. Cilantro is a big crop as I mentioned earlier. Cilantro is of course leaf coriander. I remember for many years that all you could get was a spice coriander which bolts early and produces a lot of seed and not much leaf. It was nice for the spice market but next to useless for the fresh cut cilantro market. But we knew somebody had the right cilantro strain because you could find nice bunches of cilantro on the market and they could not have been grown from the spice variety. But we could never get our hands on the seeds. Finally Slow Bolt came out and then Santo was an improvement on that. Then came Leisure. Nowadays, there is a robust breeding effort to improve yields, aroma, and flavor of cilantro varieties. And this variety, Merino, is one of the latest to come out. It is higher yielding than Santo, and it is excellent for field and greenhouse production. The pot plant market is a significant one for us as a supplier of seeds. Many of the leading potted plant growers get seeds from us. So we're always on the lookout for varieties that are suited for potted plant production. Dill is a tough one for pots because it has tap roots and it, it's, and it sends up its stalks up high early in the game in a bid to produce a crop of seeds. But like cilantro, dill is really two different herbs in one. It is a leafy herb called dillweed and it is a spice herb uh, with seeds that are used in the spice industry. Like coriander, dill varieties that are best suited for seed production are not so good for fresh leaf production and vice versa. For f potted plant growers, dill and pots usually ended up as tall and spindly and ugly and did poorly in customer gardens. So a key breeding goal is to develop varieties that look good in pots and do well in the garden. This monia dill is a big step in that direction. Even the humble parsley has been made better for pot culture. Look at the compactness and neatness of this variety, xenon. Older varieties would have a lot of open space around the lower parts of the stems. It is fantastic how the foliage fills the profile almost completely from a soil line up. Well, we've, we at Richter's have been at it for over 40 years. A big part of our business is supplying seeds and plugs to the herb industry. The commercial market is a big focus for us, and we're always looking for improved varieties suitable for the commercial growing, grower market. As you decide what your next crop mix will be, we stand ready to supply you with the best plants and seeds. At Richter's, it's not just a garden, it's a whole new world. For herb plants, seeds, veggies, and more, visit us at richters.com or call 1-800-668-4372.